So thank you for the invitation and the nice uh, introduction. Um, so as uh, Sib was uh, uh, saying, um, I'm going to be presenting the causal inference uh, from a, this potential outcome uh, perspective. And so this is a framework that is uh, to some extent uh, complementary to what uh, Silvia has just arrived, um, presented yesterday and uh, this morning. Um, I will try to be first pretty broad and so giving you a um, high level presentation of what uh, the framework is and why I think and many others uh, with me think um, that Bayesian inference is a very natural way to uh, inferring uh, causal effects, especially when those are uh, presented and um, sort of defined using contrasts of uh, potentially observable um, outcomes. Um, and then I will try to be more, very, a lot more uh, specific and present uh, like an application where um, Bayesian causal inference will be at work. And specifically, I will uh, present you an, an empirical work um, in a complex settings. Uh, this is a setting that um, arises um, uh, oftentimes, uh, so complications that oftentimes arise in, even in randomized experiments. Uh, in fact, we call them uh, broken randomized experiment. So uh, whenever there are events or um, like uh, non-compliance or missing data, loss to follow up, uh, censoring due to death, that essentially break initial randomization or change the interpretation of the causal estimates. Um, and this is a, a certain setting, those are settings where um, again, in my view, the potential outcome perspectives to causal inference combined with uh, Bayesian analysis is really key and can help answering, uh, still answering and quantifying causal effects even in these uh, complex, uh, complex and complicated settings. So, <clears throat> as we probably was already clear from uh, Silvia's presentation yesterday and, and today. Um, uh, on one hand, research questions in uh, most of the um, statistics-based uh, studies are causal in nature. So oftentimes we do not only uh, analyze association uh, between variables, um, but namely, we would like to know essentially what is the uh, causal effect of a certain intervention. And oftentimes in, um, in many fields, uh, ranging from medicine to the social sciences and other um, applied fields, um, really to um, have um, some policy implications, the statistical analysis must, um, let's say, focus or target causal quantity, right? They uh, essentially, only if uh, causal information is extracted from the data, we can use it to inform uh, policy decisions. And so, uh, causal analysis is complicated by the fact that Standard statistical analysis is about, again, uh, discovering or measuring associations among variables. And usually we use these associations, for example, for, for doing some kind of predictions. What is going to be the weather like tomorrow, or whether based on past information, whether we think that the interest rate tomorrow will be higher or lower. Causal analysis is instead, as also Silvia was uh, showing, a one step further. It is about still prediction to some extent, but it's counterfactual prediction. So we would like to predict what would have happened 
to the same units, individuals, patients, states, whatever you can think a unit uh, can be, had they been exposed at the same point in time uh, to a different condition. So I do not want to know or, uh, let's say, explore the association between people who take uh, painkillers and their headache. I would like to know uh, what is the causal effect of me taking a painkiller pain on my headache. So I would like to contrast my headache, let's say in two hours, having a headache now, if I now take the treatment or if I now do not take the treatment, right? So it's a comparison of objects, namely these potential outcomes, on the same unit at the same point in time. Right? So it's not a comparison. Uh, for inference, I will eventually need to compare these variables being observed on different units. But the goal, the target, would be to estimate, identify and estimate causal effects on a common set of units. Right? And contrast. And this is something that in statistics we are not so used to do. Right? We compare, I don't know, income uh, between females and males. That's not a causal contrast. You know, the, diff the eventual difference in, in distribution is only measuring or quantifying an association. Right? If the two distributions are different, we can say gender is associated with income or income associated with gender. Uh, for a, a, a contrast to be causal, I need to you know, compare these potential outcomes that I will now, those are the primitives that are used in this framework in as much the same way as the do calculus essentially is the primitive that we use to define causal effects using graphs. Those are the primitives that are used uh, to define causal effects. And again, uh, for a contrast to be causal, it must be the same variable in two different conditions on the same set of units. So no treated or controls, the same units when, once they are exposed treatment and, or if they had been exposed control, for example. And so, uh, however, based on the data we observe, oftentimes and in most cases, Association does not imply causation, just because in reality, comparisons among of variables in different, uh, being measured on different groups of subjects, um, only these comparisons can be used. Um, and so to make the leap from association to causation, we need to essentially introduce some causal assumptions. Those are uh, the ingredients um, of these of any uh, causal inference framework. So essentially, causal inference is about building a framework uh, with which we can define causal effects, also spell out and be transparent on the assumptions under which we can identify and, let's say, extract. Uh, causation from association that are observed in the data. Um, and also because most, or I would say almost all of the causal assumptions that are required to uh, identify causal effects have little or no testable implication. They cannot be tested from the data. So we will see you know, we have seen things like the backdoor criterion. Um, similarly, I will introduce um, assumptions like unconfoundedness or ignorability. Those are assumptions that can, can never be tested uh, from the data, using the data. So you need to believe them in observational settings. Sometimes they hold by design in experimental settings, but in observational studies, those are usually assumptions that you need to be, 
you know, have some kind of uh, subject matter knowledge to justify them and hoping they um, sort of hold. And so the framework should also allow you to, you know, provide you with um, tools that allows you to assess the sensitivity of the results of our inference towards uh, deviations from these assumptions. This is not a testing procedure because, again, these assumptions, these causal assumptions, typically have very little um, testable implications, so they cannot be tested from our data. However, there are ways of indirectly, let's say, testing them through sensitivity analysis. And again, this is a place where we can really show or highlight the benefits of uh, conducting a Bayesian analysis on causal effects. You know, we, you can see that by changing the assumptions, we can automatically see how the posterior distribution over these uh, causal estimates would change. And we can assess whether uh, results, for example, are robust, more or less robust, towards deviations from these assumptions. Okay. Um, so again, in order to build this uh, framework, uh, we can use different uh, approaches. We have seen one of them already, the causal diagram or the graph-based statistical causality, I think was how Sylvia named it. Um, and again, um, I view these two uh, frameworks as being uh, to some extent uh, complementary. Um, the potential outcome framework that I will now introduce, by the way, I've prepared like kind of too many slides, so the kind of 50 slides, um, and so I can talk uh, forever, even uh, over your booyah bess. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, so you stop me whenever you think uh, it's uh, good, and I will try to wrap up and give you uh, at least a flavor of the empirical work that I told you I would like to uh, show you. But apart from that, I'm happy to be interrupted if you have any questions uh, throughout the, my talk. All right, so, um, so this potential outcome framework to causal inference is also known as the contefactual framework or also the Rubin causal model for reasons that should be clear in a second. Um, essentially, um, and as I was just saying, uh, the two frameworks are mathematically um, highly connected. Um, however, they may have the way, um, also I believe in certain fields, one of the two is more used or less used, is beca also because of the um, areas of um, application. So, for example, in economics and also in, 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 in medicine, oftentimes we are interested in uh, or we are asked to provide evidence on a specific cause or treatment. Oftentimes this treatment is even binary. So very, very specific causal questions is the type of questions we are asked. Um, and the information, usually we typically have very little information and maybe this is something also that may not be not even all that useful on the, uh, the whole uh, structure, let's say, even causal structure or association structure of all the other variables. So essentially it's like having Sylvia's graph where we are interested in a single arrow. All the other arrows are essentially not even described as causal, right? So this is very specific. So also the type of identifying assumption flows from this uh, kind of goal, right? So we will see that the unconfoundedness assumption, again, it's rather close to the backdoor criterion. However, it is something that is not let's say, checked on a graph, right? We do not typically 
we do not exploit the topology of the graph to discover, uh, let's say, identification results. And again, this can be viewed as a limit. On the other hand, uh, sometimes, especially in the presence of um, unobserved confounders, so things that we do, like, uh, like um, nodes that cannot be observed, uh, or, for example, in settings where um, uh, units may interfere with each other so that the treatment applied to a unit may affect the outcome of another unit. Discovering, um, identifying assumptions or learning, identifying assumptions out of a graph is very difficult is even very difficult to describe these settings with the graph. So, and again, those are very specific uh, settings. So I'm not saying that the potential outcome framework is always more useful or, uh, you know, there are some, uh, again, some identifying assumptions in complex settings, like when you have more than one cause or more than one treatment as the, as the last, uh, examples that Sylvia showed, where it's not impossible to formalize the problem using potential outcomes, but it's a lot more complicated because the, as we will see in a second, these potential outcomes needs to be indexed by all the treatments that are conceived to be manipulable. And these, of course, you know, it's a, by the growing of these, uh, the number of potential outcomes, of course, it's, it's not, not a very, uh, let's say, simplistic um, description of, um, of the problem and hence more difficult to discover identifying um, uh, strategies um, in these more complex settings. Anyway, so, um, Again, I'm going to be focusing on the potential outcome uh, framework, which is rooted in the um, work by Fisher and Neiman on randomized experiments. And it is known also as the Rubin causal model for a series of papers that Don Rubin wrote in the 70s, where essentially this uh, framework was used and extended to non-randomized studies, um, also alternative modes of inference, not only randomization based, but as we will see also sampling based and, and modeling based as the Bayesian um, approach to uh, causal inference. And it's also known as the Rubin causal model because Don was, um, um, let's say, explicitly defined the assignment mechanism or described a causal inference as a problem of missing data with the assignment mechanism being the process for revealing the data we observe. So in as much the same way then that in statistics when we are, we need to deal with missing data in our, any data set, ha, set has some holes, right? So in order to do something with these holes, either impute them or, you know, delete the rows having holes, we need to be, we should be explicit on the mechanism that generated these missing data. The same is true here. The assignment mechanism, the process that decides who gets the treatment and who gets the alternative treatment needs to be uh, explicit um, and based on the assumptions on this assignment mechanism, we can also progress with inference on the causal effects. But anyway, this is a lot of talking now, I will be more uh, precise. So again, as I have done already so far, I will be using the terms cause and treatment interchangeably. And when we, this was also clear from, uh, from Silvia's presentation, but again, 
when we talk about the effect of a cause, a causal effect, um, this effect is almost always relative to another cause or to another treatment. So there is no, you know, the treatment effect of smoking, full stop. When we talk about a causal effect, it's always a causal effect of something relative to something else. So the causal effect of smoking versus smoking 20 cigarettes per day versus no smoking, or 20 cigarettes a day versus smoking one cigar, or something like that, right? So we always need to have, and these alternative uh, treatment, we contrast the first one uh, to, may also be not A, not, not the cause, or not, the, not receiving the treatment. This is why I will be using the terms uh, treatment and control, just to, to uh, at least um, say that there must be at least two doses of the treatment to talk about uh, causal effects. And essentially, the, the key notion, which is, again, sometimes, um, Hidden, hidden or even not necessary when we instead use simply the do calculus is that uh, each unit is potentially exposable to any of the causes or to any of the treatments. So I, I need to think uh, about at least hypothetically to think at the treatment as a variable that can be, at least in principle, manipulable. Okay. So, and there are um, some ingredients, let's say, some key notions that are, um, that essentially describe this potential outcome framework uh, to causal inference. So, uh, first of all, sorry. I don't know, I lost here. So um, we need to have uh, to define um, the population of units. This is also something that, of course, when doing then the analysis also based on graph uh, should be made clear. But here in the potential outcome framework, it should be clear from the very beginning. So you, once you, when you define causal effects, and introduce potential outcomes, you need to have a population of unit in mind. Those are subjects, states, uh, places at a particular point in time upon which a cause or a treatment may operate or act. So me now, it's a unit. Me at the end of the lecture is another unit. It's a different unit, right? And then, we need to also distinguish, and, and again, uh, I will introduce also this uh, distinct, distinction uh, next, but it should be clear what uh, your target, um, what the causal effect that you target, um, what population uh, the causal effect will be, um, um, let's say, relevant for. So is it a single unit, as in precision medicine, usually the target are individual treatment effects, so on Fabrizio, right? Or maybe the finite sample of units you have at hand, or maybe the finite or even infinite population from which the sample was drawn. So you need to make clear what is your target uh, population or finite population that your causal effect that you are targeting will be uh, relevant for. Then, to represent the notion of causation, again, and this is the fundamental, simple but uh, fundamental thing, uh, we postulate if, again, the treatment is binary, and again, this approach can be extended to any type of treatments. So multi-valued, co even continuous treatments, but to keep things simple, let's assume that the treatment only has two levels. So taking not taking the aspirin, being exposed to high level of pollution versus low level, assuming the treatment is binary, we postulate for a single unit the existence of two variables, 
y1 denoted by y1 and y0, which represent the potential responses associated with the two treatment um, levels. So those are the values of a unit's measurement of interest, say my headache in two hours. If I now take aspirin, the treatment, or if I now don't take the aspirin. And a causal effect for that unit is any comparison of these two potential outcomes. It can be the difference, the ratio, the log of the difference, any comparison of these two quantities is a treatment effect. And so, because essentially if I have a single unit, uh, these highlight this notion of a causal effect being the contrast of two potential outcomes highlights the fundamental problem of causal inference, namely the fact that the application of a, being exposed to one of the two levels of the treatment prevents me from uh, observing both of the potential outcomes, right? So I can only observe one of the two, the one uh, uh, associated with the treatment, the treatment level I was exposed to. So usually to, pro you know, to proceed, um, we include in the analysis more units, more units with their own uh, potential outcomes, and usually we shift even if these unit level causal effects may be of interest in some settings, again in precision medicine and also in you know, um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, policy learning and in a lot of other um, settings, in unit level causal effects may be of interest. Usually we shift the attention, let's say, to summary causal effects, like what would happen, those were also the, how Neiman in, the, in his uh, papers in the 20s um, described uh, causal effects. What would happen to, um, to um, he was talking about these potential yields. What would happen if all plots of lens would be treated with fertilizers versus what would happen to the yields if all plots of lens would not be treated with the, with the fertilizers, right? So it's a contrast of potential outcome on a common set of units. Um, all right, and, and, and again, um, this table that we call the table of science, this is what we would like to know, right? And as you can see here, this is a kind of um, more of a philosophical difference from what you saw with um, Silvia, because essentially this table of science, so the description of causal effects, Causal effects exist, we are postulating existing, irrespective of the way we are going to learn on them, whether it's through a randomized experiment, an observational study. These, those are, let's say, assumptions and, and quantities that are not involved in the description of the science. The science exists, and then it is whether whether I decide to learn uh, and so to observe some of these potential outcomes through, through an experiment or an observational study um, does not, uh, let's say, change the science, right? So, um, of course, implicit in this representation of the science is already um, a crucial uh, assumption was made namely the stable unit treatment value assumption, uh, ruling out um, the interference between units, again, as I was telling you before, uh, because the postulation, postulation we say in English? Postulazione, no, in Italian it wouldn't work. <laughs> so if, you post if we postulate the existence of only two potential outcomes, it means that I'm indexing the, my headache, let's say, only by the treatment levels I put, can potentially receive. 
So think about other settings, like settings with infectious diseases. If we want to assess the efficacy of a vaccine, me being uh, infected or not may depend not only on me deciding to be to vaccinate or not, but also to the what my neighbors are actually deciding. So it will depend also on the treatment received by people interacting with me. And this would give rise to a different representation of science. That again, this is one feature of the problem that I view being better described using potential outcomes rather than uh, I would need to augment the graph with something that entails this uh, information of uh, potential interference. Um, right, and also we are also assuming that there is no hidden version of the treatment, so no matter how a unit received the treatment, the outcome that I would observe is the outcome, let's say, I'm interested in, and the outcome that I've used to define the, the causal effects. So again, having more units in principle does not solve the problem of the fundamental problem of causal inference, because once you, because at least half of the potential outcomes, no matter how, how many units I will observe, half of the potential outcomes are always going to be missing, right? So in fact, this is also the reason why, for example, modern machine learning algorithms need to be, let's say, adjusted uh, for tar when targeting, when they are used to target uh, causal effects. Because, they, because the ground truth is never observed on any of the subjects. I cannot observe the unit level causal effect on any of the people. Once I took the aspirin, I, would, I cannot know whether my headache would have gone away even without taking aspirin, right? So I cannot attribute the pre-post comparison to the aspirin itself, right? And so because of that, I cannot train this algorithm because I do not know the ground truth. So they need to be, I need to define different you know, objective function. Uh, there is a lot of work being done there, but this, this is just to give you an idea of why I cannot take these machine learning out algorithm out of the shelf and apply them to infer or you know, estimate causal effects, because again, the usual training uh, procedures do not work here. The ground truth is, is not known, right? Okay. So, and again, because, uh, as uh, it's probably clear at this point, if I could somehow fill in all the question marks, right? So fill in all the missing values, I would be done, right? Maybe even doing it multiply in order to convey the uncertainty on these missing values, I would be done also with inference, right? So, but in order to fill in all these question marks, I need to define and pose assumption on the process that determined, so that generated the missing and the observed values. And this is known as the assignment mechanism. Uh, the assignment mechanism is essentially the probability of each assignment vectors given the science, so given the covariates and the potential outcomes, right? And essentially, the main, uh, maybe Don, uh, I hope he ag agrees, but these, um, the key contribution of his work was essentially to see randomization as just a very special and useful way to create missingness in the, in the data. So to reveal some of the potential outcomes and some other remaining uh, missing, right? Um, and so randomization, again, 
uh, sorry, by introducing the assignment mechanism uh, this way, we can formalize what, for example, um, randomized experiments are or what an observational study is. Those are simple, simply special types of assignment mechanism. In classical randomized experiments are uh, special cases of so-called uh, strongly ignorable assignment mechanism. Uh, an assignment mechanism is unconfounded, sorry, it's uh, strongly ignorable if it's unconfounded and probabilistic or as a, using a synonym, um, the overlap assumption holds. What the, do these uh, two assumptions uh, mean? Unconfoundedness essentially says that um, the uh, assignment mechanism is free of the potential outcomes, right? Meaning these pro the probability of being assigned treatment does not depend neither directly because the person may have some information that the statistician does not have on the potential outcomes. For example, I know from past experience that aspirin is somehow beneficial for me. So I treat myself with aspirin because I know that the difference between Y1 and Y0 is positive, for example, right? So that would be a direct dependence of the assignment mechanism on the potential outcomes. The dependent, potential dependence uh, on the potential outcome could also be indirect through variables that we knew, do not, that are not included in the axis, right? That can be associated with both W and Y. This was the example that I made at lunch uh, about gender. You know, gender may be associated with, uh, I don't know, uh, women tending to take more pain, uh, pain killers than men, and maybe having lower, uh, I don't know, lower headache levels. And so suppose you do not observe and hence you cannot condition on, on gender because it's not in your data set, these would create dependence of the assignment mechanism on the potential outcomes, right? But if we can rule out these um, uh, dependence, we have an, an ignorable assignment mechanism. Namely, we are essentially assuming that within cells defined by observed uh, covariates, nature, or maybe even uh, an analyst, if we are uh, conducting a randomized experiment, um, flip the coin and as for assigning a subject to either treatment or control, right? So essentially within cells defined by the covariates, units are exchangeable, right? So I can compare treated and controls condition along uh, on covariates. And of course, I also require that the propensity score, the, probab the conditional probability of being treated is bounded away from zero and one so that for each level of, of the covariates, as at least in large samples, I can, yeah. <laughs> I told you that it was it. All right, okay, I will. Yeah, it's okay. Um, I can compare, I can always find treated and controls to compare, right? Okay, so um, again, um, modes of inference. So this is a setting and I can target uh, any contrast of these potential outcomes on this common set of units. How do we want to proceed with, with inference on these causal effects? So essentially these potential outcomes, I view them as I simply said, those are potential outcome variables uh, that I denote with Y1 and, and Y0, but I didn't tell you the nature of these potential outcomes. So <clears throat> essentially the usual frequentist 
uh, approach to inference on these causal effects, exploit or viewed um, only two sources of randomness. The ones that comes from the random assignment of the Ws of the treatment, and possibly once a distribution is uh, postulated on the potential outcomes, this comes from, this is the distribution that is generated from the random sampling. So essentially the potential outcomes are viewed as fixed quantities that exist out there. So the table of science is full of numbers, uh, some of which we can observe, some others we cannot observe, and we include, you know, derived procedures that are, have certain properties over the randomization or the sampling distribution. And then instead the Bayesian approach is kind of the third leg of these potential outcome framework to causal inference. Uh, the first one being define the science, second, posit an assignment mechanism, third, uh, specify a model on the science. Once we have a model for of the science, on the science, we can use the Bayesian, Bayesian inference, so the Bayesian machinery and the Bayes theorem, to essentially derive, once we have, again, assumed something on the assignment mechanism, the posterior predictive distribution of the missing potential outcomes. This is always needed to, let's say, impute the missing potential outcomes and then summarize them any way we want and hence derive also the posterior distribution of any causal estimate we want, right? It seems easy, it's usually relatively easy. Of course, there are some features of this process that are critical, like defining a model for, uh, for the, the science is not a rather easy task, right? So uh, there are a lot of um, assumptions, either implicit or explicit, that have implications on how the causal effect are or these posterior distributions are uh, derived. Um, specifically, um, okay, those are kind of the advantages of this Bayesian model-based uh, inference that I kind of discussed uh, already uh, in the uh, introduction. Um, but essentially, let me, I don't know, two minutes? <laughs> Five minutes, whatever. Uh, let me maybe <laughs> okay so essentially once you have defined a model for the science and made assumptions on W on the process that generated the missing and the observed data in principle it is for you expert in Bayesian analysis is rather straightforward to, to derive the posterior predictive distribution of these of the missing potential outcomes and essentially most of the time two things simplify this approach first is assuming that this joint distribution for each unit of the, all the, the random variables involved um, is driven by some um, finite or even infinite uh, parameter and conditional on which these random variables are IID. Uh, second, if we can assume either by design or by assumption that the assignment mechanism is ignorable, in fact, 
it can be is ignorable. This uh, adjective is was. Um, given to this uh, to assignment mechanism with this property because in fact it can be ignored there is no need to model the assignment mechanism is this is, igno is uh, ignorable of course and then i will try to stop and of course i okay uh, i haven't shown you not even uh, i'm always uh, fond of uh, actually looking at the data and see numbers and results instead of uh, keeping things uh, up in the air so maybe so there are other things that are uh, implicit in the way i sort of derive these uh, posterior predictive distribution so for ignorability we also need to assume that the prior independence of the parameters that uh, let's say characterize the distribution of the uh, of w the outcome and the covariates and these also has implications on the role the propensity score plays in in bayesian inference but of course this is a subject to a separate huge amount of uh, literature and contribution that i won't uh, uh, discuss uh, here um, also uh, I was silent on the assumptions on the association parameters between potential outcomes, right? I told you we need to pose a model on the science. The science involves both of the potential outcomes. So in principle, we need to be explicit on how we think my headache with and without out, uh, um, aspirin are related. And those are these association parameters, are parameters that uh, the data are not informative for, because y1 and y0 can never be jointly observed. So superpopulation um, um, causal effects are typically, so the posterior distribution of superpopulation causal effect are free of these association parameters, but finite population are not causal effect are not, because I need to, you know, impute the missing potential output for me, conditioning on what I, what I observe for me. And so I need to postulate some, uh, need to, you know, assume something on how these two potential outcomes are related, if I need to draw from the posterior predictive distribution. So there are, it's not all that, straightforward, let's say, as I told you, can be. Uh, but again, all these uh, complications have kind of um, uh, dis have been discussed in the literature, so you can find s solutions there. OK, the extension that I wanted to, maybe in the one minute I have left, that I wanted to talk about is these problem that of course would require an extra hour to present um, but essentially the problem first of all the problem is one that as i was saying arises in both um, experiment and observational studies suppose for example that you have a um, you, you want to assess a, an end of life type treatment uh, on a primary outcome that is quality of life, six months or two years after initial randomization. Of course, through, unfortunately, through or along the way, uh, so before the six months or the two years, no matter how you define your primary outcome, some people may die. So quality of life two years after initial randomization is not only not observed, it's yet another missingness mechanism. It's not only not observed, but it's also ill-defined for someone who's dead, right? So it cannot even be imputed somehow. What is the quality of life of someone who is no longer here, right? And so, in order to, and, and also because these, the death lies on the causal 
pathway, let's say it's a post-treatment outcome, I cannot simply condition uh, on survival and on the survivors and hence uh, compare quality of life of those who survive under treatment with those who survive under control. Because these two groups are no longer under, um, uh, you know, they are not formed by randomization, right? Because the treatment may also have an effect on survival. Right? So the survivors under treatment are different, a different group of subjects than the survivors under control. And so it makes no sense to actually define or contrast quality of life for these subjects. And so principle stratification, which is what I wanted to, and then I'll stop, show you it's a way of formalizing these type of uh, problems essentially formalizing causal effects for subset of units, for example, in this case, this specific case, characterized by surviving under both circumstances. If I could identify the subjects who would be alive after two years under both treatment conditions, for them, it would make sense to compare quality of life, right? Because for them, quality of life is well-defined under both treatment and control, right? And so, of course, again, Bayesian analysis is useful for identifying and estimating effects on these subgroups of units, strata of units. Usually the data that we observe are mixtures of distributions of these potential outcomes within these strata. And so I can use, we can use um, also Bayesian uh, model-based approaches to disentangle these mixtures. And these, and these are, we will really conclude, unfortunately. You will have uh, the slides and also the, the paper. Maybe you can take a look there. But this type of approach was successfully applied um, in many different settings, also using for modeling these complex uh, mixture structures, um, also using um, mixtures of Dirichlet processes and Gaussian processes. Uh, that gives, uh, you know, the modeling flexibility that is really useful. Basta. All right.